Picture this. You're driving home from work. The sky's clear, the air sweet. But then you make a turn. A column of thick, black, billowing smoke spews from the earth like a serpent consuming the sun. You quickly roll up your windows, but it's impossible to escape the harsh chemical stench. Traffic has slowed to a crawl in both directions. You're stuck, and the serpentine pool is slinking towards you. That air quality disaster erupted from a fire in one of the world's largest waste dump sites, set in the heart of one of the most populous cities in the world, Lagos, Nigeria. Five years on from the Olu Shorsun dump site fire, the event remains emblematic of Lagos's air quality problem. Devastating and inescapable. Today on Our Broken Planet, we're exploring how the people of Nigeria are working to transform their atmosphere. From the Natural History Museum, this is Our Broken Planet where we find out how we created some of the problems in our modern world and search for solutions from nature and science. I'm Tori Herridge. And I'm Khalil Thurloway. In this episode, we'll be looking at air pollution in one of the world's most populous countries, Nigeria, and its largest city, Lagos. Tori, what do we mean when we talk about air pollution? Yeah, I mean, it can be many, many different things, right? I mean, it, the air you breathe can, is always a cocktail of different gases. And sometimes the gases that we breathe are things we put into it that are not particularly nice, right? So uh, these are, we're talking about harmful stuff, things you might have heard of, like carbon monoxide, ozone, nitrogen oxide, you know, gases that, you know, on their own, you know, they, they are naturally occurring. But we produce more of them, in, particularly in urban settings. And when we breathe those things in, it can make us sick. Um, one of the other things, of course, that makes up a, you know, a big part of the problem with air pollution is the particulate matter. That is the kind of the, the basically the, the, the dust. It's like this, you know, it's especially that very fine particulate matter, which is often known as PM 2.5, just referring to particles that are smaller than 2.5 microns. And you know, that stuff is particularly problematic because if that gets inside your lungs, it can cause real health problems. And the smaller the particles, the deeper they can get in your body. The really small ones can actually pass through your lungs and into your blood and start influencing and affecting other systems and organs in the body. Yeah, I mean, quite often people think about it as linked to asthma. It is. You know, breathing problems obviously make sense because you're breathing this stuff in. But there's also links to heart disease, risk of stroke, um, lung cancer. And all these aspects increase as the air quality declines. That term PM2.5 is going to come up a few times in this episode. So just remember, we're talking about tiny toxic particles that can both get into your lungs and further deeper into your body. Because, of course, air pollution, this particulate matter, is something that is really you know, an urban phenomenon to, you know, to a greater extent. And that's a problem for the world because over half the world now lives in cities. And our cities are continuing to grow. That means more buildings, more transport options, more construction work to build the cities themselves. And then, of course, the energy that's needed to do all this stuff, to support all this infrastructure. And with all the people living there, of course, more waste. And all of this affects air quality. Now, the star of today's show, Lagos in Nigeria, is a city on the Atlantic coast in sub-Saharan Africa. It's Nigeria's most populous city with some 20 million people, and that's expected to double by 2050. And if we look beyond that, it's also on track to become the world's most populous city by 2100, with a projected 88 million inhabitants. And this growth at this pace is coming with a multitude of air quality problems. Lagos air quality, it's a bit complex because of the complex sources. This is Dr. Rose Alani, head of the Air Quality Monitoring Research Group at the University of Lagos. You know, Lagos is a small area that is carrying a very big load. I normally like describing Lagos like Nigeria being a coconut and Lagos being like a peanut, just a dot there. And the population is so high. Lagos used to be Nigeria's capital until the early 1990s. When the capital was moved to Abuja, investment in Lagos's infrastructure stalled, but it still remains Nigeria's biggest economy. 
is the central place for industrial and all the commercial activities. So a lot is happening here. A lot of activities that need a lot of power. And because of poor electricity supply, Lagosians have to generate electricity themselves. The problem of electricity is there. Every home must have a generating plant, even if it is small, sometimes more than one or two. And factories also must have generating plants. And it's every day that it runs. Lagos is also notorious for its traffic, or as the locals call it, go slow. Within one kilometer of road in, in Lagos, we have 227 vehicles. Most of the vehicles are using fuel that is not up to the standard and having a lot of sulfur, and so it's that bad. So, Tori, Lagos has recorded levels of air pollution that are up to six times more than the recommended World Health Organization air quality levels. Yeah, I mean, that's a, a horrible number, but it's not unusual for megacities. It puts it in the same kind of category as megacities like Beijing, Cairo, Mumbai. So, you know, it's, it's, it's a big city problem. You know, if you've got these megacities without the infrastructure to keep the energy production and the fuel types on the clean side, a lot of people make a lot of mess. And air pollution isn't generally evenly distributed across a city. You know, you'll get it concentrated around industry and roads, things like that. And here's another fact for you. Apparently, Lagosians spend on average around 30 hours a week in traffic. Oh, man. That's almost a working week that's like a, in yeah, traffic on the traffic. way to work. Like if you're only going to work five, that's like, if you only do five day working week, that means you're spending, what, six hours a day in a car in traffic. And something that makes it worse is that often... The cars they're sitting in this traffic are imported second-hand vehicles from other parts of the world. In 2014, 74% of cars imported to Nigeria were used cars from overseas. And almost two-thirds of those were older than 11 years. Yeah, and that basically means the older your car, the more likely it is to be one that produces a lot of particulate matter. And that's partly due to wear and tear, and it's also partly due to the fact that technology has advanced and standards have been tightened as time has gone on and we've realised what a problem air pollution from road traffic is. Yeah, and it is a problem. It is a problem. In Lagos, 30% of that tiny particulate matter pollution, that PM2.5 pollution, comes from road transportation. So if you are an average Lagosian spending your 30 hours a week in traffic, then you are most likely breathing in an awful lot of that PM2.5. It feels like a massive problem, right? But even so, that's only 30% of the story, right? 30% of that PM2.5 particulates are coming from traffic. Where's the other 70% coming from? Well, one of the biggest, biggest issues for Lagosians as well is the fact that their power grid, their, like, their infrastructure, isn't up to the job for supporting one of the biggest economies in West Africa. Now, Lagos gets some power from the national grid, but far from enough, and inconsistently. So power is only live for about 12 hours a day. But this unreliable supply has led Lagosians to find an alternative source of power. Many people across the world might only hear the hum of a generator when passing by a construction site, or whilst partying at a festival, or when a -a once-in-a-lifetime natural disaster knocks out the electricity. But for hundreds of Nigerians, it's a fact of daily life. In fact, I cannot remember living without a generator. As far back as I was five or four years old, over 42 years ago. (laughs) This is Oyu Deyo Yusuf, or Deyo. Deyo is an embryologist and co-owns an IVF clinic in Lagos, Nigeria. Sometimes it's like what you would say, like white noise. (laughs) Sometimes it feels like that. But you never really understand the impact until when everywhere is silent. And then you are like, wow, that generator was actually loud. Lagos roars day in and day out in a cacophony of generators. With erratic electricity supply, generators power around half of the city. Ask some Lagosians to live without a generator or gen, and they may well look at you as if you have lost your mind. Who who does that? How can you not have a gen? Like... It's not a luxury. It's a necessity. 
in Nigeria, in Lagos. And 86% of businesses in Nigeria rely on generators, like Dayo's IVF clinic. We don't get power 24-7 from a co-distribution, which is the electricity distribution board in Lagos State. So we need our equipment, particularly the incubators, on 24 hours. Not only do we have generators, we also have inverters, you know, and we do not want any downtime. We don't even want a five minutes downtime. That's how important generator is. But these generators come with a lethal cost. These generators, or GENs as they're known locally, account for a fifth of PM2.5 air pollution, that tiny particulate matter we were talking about. In 2019, nearly 24,000 Lagosians died prematurely because of the air quality. That's more than deaths from malaria and more than double those in Lagos caused by HIV and AIDS. Generator fumes aren't just bad to breathe in. They can also ruin Dayors and her lab's best efforts. The fumes contain carbon monoxide. And where you have poor air quality, especially where you have a lot of um, volatile organic compounds, maybe from fumes or from all that kind of smell that goes into the lab, studies have shown that this actually affects the quality of the embryos within the IVF laboratory. So if the air is not clean, the volatile organic compounds, the VOCs, which is carbon monoxide and all that, can actually bind to that media, which are harmful to the embryos. Dale's left in the unenviable position where the generator that is helping give her patients hope could also slash their odds of having children. <sighs> Thinking about it now, I mean, it doesn't really feel good. So just take all the precautions. But if we didn't have to use generator, of course we would prefer that, especially for the kind of work we do. That is a really unenviable position to be in. Like every single embryo is the hope that someone has invested in, in you know, a potential future child. And, it, and the success rate of those embryos are almost entirely down you know, to the lab. And if you can't keep the power on, then you can't keep the embryos alive for long enough to, to re-implant them. For a little bit of context, we've brought in Jill Achineku, the producer on this episode, who grew up in Lagos. Hey, Jill. <laughs> Hi, Khalil. Hi, Tari. <laughs> I know. We're, we're like suddenly under scrutiny because like, the producer can't the even stay outside. Here. I know. She's like in and coming in to like keep an eye on us. <laughs> but no, obviously, like what I haven't, I think what I really want to hear about is actually like what it's like to live with the continuous hum of a generator. I never got a generator because the sound used to drive me crazy because it wasn't just my generator. It was the guy upstairs that had the generator. It was the guy selling in front of the house. This constant roar that's just in your head and you really can't think. Some people adapt to it and some people joke that Nigerians are really loud because our voices have to go so high to go, <laughs> <laughs> to go above the generator's roar. I tried to do without one, but it was very much that my... My refrigerator used to get defrosted and sometimes my food would go bad. I couldn't charge my devices, so I would charge them all up um, in the office and hope when I get home there's actually electricity. You know, you just heard from Dale and it's like, that's life. That's people's embryos that could be their future child. Like running an IVF clinic under that kind of energy, like insecurity... It, I mean, I don't even know how it's possible, really. Yeah, generators are very essential um, in Nigeria, especially for businesses like Dyer's, where she is actually giving hope to people. Nigeria is a very conservative country, so you sort of have that uh, sort of like a pipeline where, you know, you get married and then you have children. And a couple of months after you get married, people start asking you, where is the baby? Why aren't you <laughs> pregnant already? And it's not enough to have one. You have to have two, three. Previously, children were essential for you when you actually get retired. Children are looked at as, yes, a source of pride, but also you're not really considered a woman until you have a child. Hmm. And it makes it very, very essential in the culture. Thank you so much, Jill. I think you should get back and start bossing us around again. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, guys. So when we're talking about the gens, it's important to acknowledge that Nigeria, it's still one of the smallest contributors to world pollution and climate change. Only 0.23% of global emissions come from Nigeria, compared to, if we look at US and China, 
at the number two and number one spots globally, they're at 14 and 29% respectively. And we're looking at this from the outside. But if your choice is putting food on the table or breathing clean air, that's not always going to be the top priority for everyone. I was, you know, commuting. As a general rule, traveling by public transportation is actually better for the environment. But in this case, it wasn't better for my health. This is Joshua Gabriel Oluwasei, a 22-year-old climate and environmental activist from Lagos. The bus had like a hole. So if you're sitting down, you literally could be looking at the road as you're moving. The bus began to smoke. And initially we talked, the bus was on fire. It was coming directly into the bus. That was just one of those moments where I couldn't quite fathom how Nigerians are so uneducated on the harmfulness of air pollution that we just let us like that slide. When Joshua was 18, he found out he was allergic to air pollutants. He gets itchy eyes, tight chest, and painful sneezing. Not fun. Generally, every single day that you live and breathe Lagos, you are, you are in the story of an air quality pandemic. These are people who, kind of people who were in that bus with me who did not even know that they're inhaling something so bad for them and it could kill them. It's just one of those moments that grounded me in my activism, my advocacy. In 2019, Joshua set up his non-profit organization, Learn Blue. It's run by Gen Zers for Gen Zers. They inspire young people to take action on the environment and climate change. So when I learned about uh, my allergy and also just learned about pollution and went into this rabbit hole on climate change, the first question I asked myself was, okay, my goal is not to protest. My goal is to change people's mindsets. And so we focus our attention on Gen Zers, but also we are the biggest volunteer generation in the world. One of Joshua's first campaigns to improve air quality was helping clean up plastic waste. Plastic waste makes up 29% of Lagos' waste, and some people get rid of it by burning. We basically, from one tweet thread, packed conversation, outrage, passion, reaching over 200,000 people on social media and eventually over a million in about a week, um, and mobilizing hundreds of people across Lagos to, you know, do cleanups. Um, I ended up cleaning over, I think, 40,000 pounds of non-biodegradable waste, which is an insane amount of waste to clean up in just about a month. As a self-described storyteller, Joshua has taken his message around the world. He's been on the BBC, the pages of Teen Vogue, and attended summits outside his country. But back home in Nigeria, his message may be a bit harder to get across. I kept using the word we're ill-informed, but the reality even more so is people are poor. There is a clear link, an often ignored one, but a clear link between climate change, global warming, air pollution as it relates to my story, and poverty as it relates to Nigeria. Nigeria has one of the highest poverty rates in the world. Four out of ten Nigerians live on 97 cents or less per day. People are not thinking about air pollution, the climate, or how it affects their personal health. People are thinking about, you know, where they're getting their next meal, how they're going to send their child to school, who's going to pay the school fees. So it's very hard to really make change when it comes to air pollution in Nigeria, or generally climate change, if you cannot understand that people first need their basic needs met, clothing, food, and shelter. If those three things are not met, it's a lot harder to create frameworks and policies that can address climate change Conversations like these also open up difficult questions around access and equity when it comes to energy. Around the world, we all rely on energy every day. And I get frustrated a lot when, you know, our world leaders go to these events and they talk about solutions to help, you know, go green or they give timelines. And I'm all for that. But in countries or regions like Africa, Sub-Saharan Africa, where people are poor, people don't have cost and electricity. These proposals that leaders make are generally not even tailored to the communities they're trying to serve. Joshua is also keen for Lagos' leaders to know that there's still work to be done and that young people can play a part. I don't think the government consults news enough. I don't even think it pays as much attention and there is still so much more that needs to be done. And, and I think this sort of message really goes out to government 
and I would also say young people who want to build organizations that that sort of create solutions that are helping combat Lagos's major issues, be it rising sea levels, be it pollution, be it air pollution or recycling. We need policy and we need more advocacy and we need more youth involvement. I mean, do you like the Joshua? It has a kind of the, the activist optimism that you can just keep powering through and that you know, voices will make a difference. But equally, it sucks. Joshua's approach of trying to change people's attitudes, to build that from the ground upwards and to advocate upwards to government, I have a lot of hope for that because we've tried a lot of top-down approaches and we're still melting. Um, and Joshua's point about the international discourse as well. The fact that, you know, we we know that we need to consume less and, and cut down on the amount we're emitting and our energy use and our resource use. But those are often directives coming from richer countries, countries that have benefited by extracting resources from other countries for a long time. And so it's got to be incumbent on the richer and more powerful countries to at least support and and help find ways for places like Nigeria to make that transition towards a future that is healthier and more sustainable for its people as well as for the world. I think actually uh, incredibly hopeful is, maybe people will say it's naive, but I'm going to go for hopeful, um, is the scale of the ambition that is stated by the Nigerian government, at least, right? So currently, you've got Nigeria sitting at 108 out of 120 countries on this thing called the Energy Transition Index, the ETI, right? So they are pretty low down the, you know, where they're set up for transitioning to clean energy. And yet, they still initially signed up for the 2050 net zero target, just like... UK, right? Um, and they've recently revised that. It's like, oh, it's going to be a bit harder, but they've revised it to 2060, which, I mean, I think that's incredible to still have that ambition. Like, to not just go, do you know what? It's necessary evil. We aren't going to bother. You know, we're going to focus on poverty and getting people out of poverty and we'll just have to, you know, take the hit on the on the climate side of things. But they've still got that ambition to transition. It's like, how do we help them achieve it? I mean, the stated ambition is great and... Uh hopefully with enough pressure and energy from grassroots activists like Joshua and and Learn Blue that will you know they'll stick to it but a commitment coming from an oil producing country I'll take it with a pinch of salt yeah but you got it it's committed at least i mean i didn't yeah. you, you say it you articulate it it's more likely for it to happen oh absolutely i'm not writing off this commitment i'm just uh never give up never give in we'll know it when we see it <laughs> <laughs> But like you said, never give up, never give in. That's why activists like yeah. Joshua are so important. Yeah. Despite your scepticism, Khalil, things are happening. Nigeria is making moves towards a greener economy and taking steps to improve air quality. I understand the problem. I have first-hand knowledge of the scientific basis of air pollution in Lagos and the impacts. This is Dr. Mofalusho Fabajar, an air quality specialist who lives in Ifer, a town about 120 miles northeast of Lagos. I am quite conscious of the environment the moment I step into Lagos. I'm, I'm like, I need to extra protect myself. I need to be mindful of where I go to. Mofalusho consulted on a 2021 study for the Lagos State Environmental Protection Agency. In it, they looked at the health and economic impacts and also came up with an air quality management plan to solve the problem. That study conducted a monitoring for a period of 12 months. And interestingly, that was the very first time that we had comprehensive air quality monitoring in Lagos. As part of the study, they set up six monitoring sites across the city. One of the sites was placed in a school in Ikarodu, which sits on the outskirts of Lagos. There are a lot of people living in Ikorodu. At the same time, it's also an industrialized area. So there are metal smelting factories in Ikorodu. Some of them are quite close to the school where the monitoring station was located. Across a year, the Ikorodu site registered 97 micrograms of PM2.5. That's a whopping 19 times more than WHO annual guidelines. 
They also found lead aerosol, 10 times more than the USA's environmental protection standards. No one knew this was happening before the sensors were installed. When we observed that, and we reported that to the Lagos State Environmental Protection Agency, they actually went there and they sealed up some of those factories. Lagos also has a waste management problem. It churns out about 13,000 tonnes of solid waste a day. Translated into my favourite unit of measurement, that's about 2,600 big African male elephants every day. All that waste has to go somewhere. Unfortunately, the rate of collection is just a little above 50%. So you have the remaining waste grossly mismanaged, even from the waste that has been managed, that's been collected and deposited at the landfills. Now, remember that horrible smoke from the start of the episode, where in 2018, this mismanagement led to the burning of the Olu Shorsun landfill, an area the size of 20 football fields. Thick, toxic smoke engulfed the surrounding residential areas and people sitting in traffic. It burned for hours. That's what a lot of Nigerians actually experience. The Lagos State government has taken steps to ensure that that such a thing doesn't reoccur again. They are already moving the landfill away from there to ensure that the existence of the landfill in that place is not adversely affecting the health of uh, people. In recent times, Lagos has been slowly building its governance and infrastructure. Laws are being introduced to regulate generators, industrial emissions and open air burning. A new metro line is slated to launch in August to help with traffic. They're working on electrifying their city buses. The state is also collaborating with the private sector to move towards renewable solutions. With all the efforts we're putting in place, I believe Lagos is going to get there. Yeah, Lagos will definitely will get there. Well, it's great to hear that steps are being taken. Like our producer Jill told me about GIVO centres, which are G-I-V-O. Right, OK. Which stands for Garbage In, Value Out. No, and... no, no comment on our producer's ability <laughs> here. <laughs> So GIVO centres are local commercial recycling centres where people can bring their waste, for example, plastic or glass, and then the company who run the centre can repurpose and recycle those materials into stuff that makes them money. You sound pretty positive about it. Well, you know, as far as capitalism goes, at least it's pointed in the right direction. Yeah, well, you know, you might be positive about it, but Lagosians, I mean, many of them are sceptical. Because, you know, understandably, that, you know, people in Lagos are like, really? And, you know, things don't seem to move pretty fast here. You know, there is some scepticism about it. Metro I mentioned earlier, that was first announced in 2003, right? And so it's supposed to start operation in August 2023. So I guess we'll know in a month or so. I like your positivity, but there is some scepticism amongst Lagosians. And I think that scepticism is really important and healthy because that is what's going to keep people, whether it's activists or the general population, they're going to keep their leaders accountable and they're going to keep scrutiny on them. As soon as you start getting complacent, that's when you take your eye off the ball and progress can slow down. Yeah, I mean, I suppose so. But there's also the other side of sort of like, you know, kind of world weary scepticism. Like kind of like, oh, yeah, which is when you kind of just get inured to people saying these things and you just, and you just keep on going about your daily grind right which is you know you're thinking like yeah okay it's gonna be a metro line oh yeah whatever well I'll believe it when I see it and you don't do anything about it so you skeptical but skeptical with purpose and it's things like people you know like Joshua are the kind of people who keep that purpose going I feel like you know they're continuing to to sort of push for these little things again and they need to because there is still this massive energy supply gap which is probably the biggest thing that needs to be fixed for everybody in the city. We've talked about poverty levels in Nigeria. Now, urbanisation is something that helps to reduce poverty. And this is happening right now in Nigeria. But a study from the OECD, the Organisation for Economic Cooperation and Development, has shown that since the 1990s, deaths from air pollution have risen at the same rate as urbanisation. How does a developing nation break that link between air pollution and the urbanisation that lifts its people out of poverty? 
African leaders make the argument that yes, others have developed and this is how they develop. It is not necessary for us to say, because say this continent or this country developed by burning coal. So we also have to burn coal. Maybe they didn't know better. Now we do. This is Desmond Appiah. He's the country lead in Ghana for the Clean Air Fund. The Clean Air Fund is an international philanthropic organization that supports projects that promote clean air. You know, the picture is not good. It is getting worse. Our population in urban centers is growing. We're going to be 65% urbanized by 2050. More urbanization is good. It creates more economic boom. But at what expense? And we cannot and should not be going on the path where we are not putting enough investment in sustainable investment. That will not have negative impacts on the air and on all of us. According to the Clean Air Fund, from 2015 to 2020, Nigeria received just $250,000 in international development air quality funding. When you think about the nature of how the development aid is coming and what it means, we're getting support to put more money into fossil-based development, which is not tackling the pollution and the other things that need to be tackled in that longer term. Across the continent, people are not waiting for aid before taking action. Solutions are being implemented right now in cities. Uh, in, in Rwanda, in Kigali, they've improved their walkways, planted quite a lot of trees around these walkways that people can walk. They've introduced electric vehicles. Recently in Sierra Leone, they were planting a million trees so they can reduce their landslides and also improve the quality of air. If you go to Addis Ababa, they also have a tram system in the middle of uh, Addis. If you go to Nairobi, the new mayor, young mayor in Nairobi, is trying to electrify the Okada, the motorbikes that people are using, to electrify it so that they don't use fossil fuels and they do not pollute. We need to also highlight the good things that are happening across the continent so people know that it is not impossible. It is very possible in this our generation to make these changes. It's great to see local governments and national governments really taking action and making changes that they're not just changing systems, but they're also changing the ways that these cities are, the spaces they are for people to inhabit. You know, talking about making cool tree-covered walkways so that people feel more comfortable walking in the daytime rather than getting in a, a car and sticking on the AC. It's one of those topics, I think, you know, sort of making a city more livable, which people feel the effects immediately. And often even unpopular policies, once they're in place, people love them. Yeah, and, you know, change can be scary, especially when we see a lot of unexpected negative changes happening in our lives, both locally and globally. But once you can get past that, that anxiety, at, oh, what are you going to do to the city that I live in, the city that I love? Often, you end up with something much better afterwards. You know, so like Lagos, by 2100, projected to be one of the world's biggest cities, most popular cities. On one hand, people see that as a problem, but also like, you know, these, these young like, cities, these, yeah, these beginnings, these mega cities, there's an opportunity, right, to, to build really good ones if we make it happen. Like, I somehow I can't help but be hopeful in some ways that if we just like harness ourselves now and like, get in there and try and build a really great mega city, then mega cities could be a way to have people live together uh, without making a, a, a mega impact on the world around them. And this kind of optimism and this uh, agency and taking control of, of what the, the places we live in are like, it's exemplified in, there's a, a, a subgenre of science fiction that's been growing recently called solar punk. And this is coming mostly out of Africa and Latin America, but other places around the world. And instead of the kind of cyberpunk dystopian future that all looks like Blade Runner and it's all dark and gross and grotty. Solar Punk envisages a future where the our connections with the spaces we live in and the nature around it are much more intimate and connected and and that we actually look forward to a positive future that we can take charge and make rather than 
resigning ourselves to a dystopian hellscape. It's not just about reacting to the negative now, right? The negative now is like there are children and people living in poverty in Lagos who are breathing in air they should not be breathing, right? That's a, that's a push factor. But ahead, there should also be a pull factor, which is the Lagos of the future, which is going to be big. And hopefully, it's going to be an amazing, productive, beautiful place to live with the right planning. It makes you realise that there's, yeah, there's work to be done. Yeah, you know, There's work to be done in Lagos, there's work to be done here in the UK, there's work to be done in every single large city, because cities really are the future. We can't all live on massive rolling estates of our own and grow around vegetables and things like that. That's not going to fix the world. Right? City living is what the future is going to look like for a lot of people, and we need to make them the cleanest, most beautiful, most wonderful places to live and be human that we can. And going back to that solar punk vision of the future... You know, a lot of the issues we've been talking about in this episode, whether it's in Lagos or around the world, they boil down to one key central issue. And that's that we need to build a green energy future for everyone in the world. But to build that green future, we're going to need a whole lot of resources. So join us next time on Our Broken Planet, where we'll be diving deep to find out how we're going to resource this green economy. Well, I'm off next week, so I'm going to leave this one to you, Khalil. Thanks for listening to Our Broken Planet. We hope you've learned something along the way and please don't despair. We all have an important role to play in helping to fix the problems in our world and it starts with having conversations just like the ones in this episode. As many of us as possible. Our Broken Planet is presented by Tori Herridge and me, Khalil Thurlaway. The producer was Jill Achinaku. The series producer is James Tyndale and the executive producer was Will Yates. Our Broken Planet is a Whistledown production for the Natural History Museum.